Understanding the concepts of option and result might be fairly straightforward, but using them in practice can get a little tricky. Let's look at a really simple example, never going above a handful of lines of code, to walk through many of the most common and useful ways to use these containers. Option is Rust's answer to the infamous billion dollar mistake. I'm not actually talking about this. That was probably much less expensive. I'm talking about the concept of nullable values without proper compile time checks to account for said nullability. The term billion dollar mistake came from Tony Hoare himself. Of course, option isn't unique to Rust. Some form of option exists in pretty much every language these days, and its primary purpose is to make it explicit when something can have no value. So an option is an enum, generic type T, that can have one of two values, none or some. In Rust, each enum value is a struct. And in this case, none happens to be a unit struct. So so it's a struct with no fields. And sum happens to be a tuple struct. So it has one field of type T, but that field doesn't have a name. Let's take a look at result. So you can see result is very similar to option, except instead of one generic type, it has two. And instead of having a none value, it has an error value of type E. So we have two tuple structs in result, OK, which has a value of type T, and error, which has a value of type E. Result is Rust's way of explicitly defining success and error states and making it easier for developers to properly Replicate errors up the stack if necessary. Many established languages use the concept of exceptions to do this, but Rust and other newer languages use a special container for return values instead, which is what result is. Its container for success is called OK, and its container for errors is called error. I mentioned that the core concepts of option and result are fairly easy to understand, but there's so many ways to handle and emit them in practice, and even translate between them, so let's look at some of the most common patterns. What we're going to write is a function that takes a vector of strings, tries to parse each string into an integer, computes the sum of all those integers, and then converts the result back to a string and returns it to the caller. This function is going to be called sumsterVec. So sumsterVec. It's going to take a vector of strings and return a string. First, we're going to make an accumulator of type i32. This is going to keep a running sum of the numbers. And then we're going to write a for each loop. We could write this in a functional way using the dot map function, but we're going to write it as a for each loop to illustrate some concepts. Inside the loop, we're going to call to int, which is a function that we're going to write that's going to take a string, convert it to an integer, and return it. And then we're going to add that integer to our accumulator. At the end of the function, after the for loop, all we need to do is convert that integer back to a string and return it to the caller. We'll write a quick main function to test this out, and then we'll go back and implement the to int function. In the main function, we're going to create a vector with two strings, one for three and one for four. And then we're going to pass that vector into sumster vec, get back the total, and then print out the total. Now we just need to implement the toInt function. The toInt function is going to take a borrowed reference to a string slice and return an integer. All we need to do in this function is s.parse, and then we're going to do unwrap. And that should do it. In the real world, we probably wouldn't write a separate function for this, but we're going to use it to illustrate a concept. S.parse actually returns a result. So if we look at the definition of S.parse, we can see it returns a result. Result has a function called unwrap that we're using here that's actually pretty simple. If the result is of the variant OK, unwrap is going to return the value contained in that OK. And if the result is of type error, the program's going to panic. So when you call unwrap, you're basically agreeing to let your program crash if there's ever an error result. That can be nice for when you're prototyping and building things out really quickly, just testing the happy path. But generally speaking, you probably don't want unwrap in your production code. By calling unwrap, I'm basically deferring any error handling. And I'm saying that if this result is ever of the error variant, I'm conceding to let my program crash. OK, let's test this thing out. OK, we got 7, like we expect. Let's add some more code in the main function to test out the case where one of the elements of the vector is not actually a number. Now we've made another vector that has the string 3 and then another string ABC, which is obviously not a number. The first thing we have to ask ourselves is how do we want our program to handle the scenario where some of the numbers in the vector are parsable and others are not? Do we want sumster vec to return an error or maybe none? Or do we want it to give us a sum of the numbers that are parsable and just assume that the non-parsable elements are 0? As written right now, the program will just completely crash if any of the elements of the vector are not parsable. That's probably not what we want. Let's run this again. 
and we can see we got seven and then we got a panic. We tried to call s.parse on the string abc. That returned an error. And because the result was of the error variant, unwrap is going to cause the program to panic. And so we can see that here. Thread main panicked at called result unwrap. There's another function of result called expect. And expect is similar to unwrap in that if the result is of the OK variant, it's going to return the value contained in that OK. And if the result is of the error variant, it's still going to panic, but you get to specify a custom error message. So now instead of calling unwrap, we're calling expect and we're passing it in a string with our custom error message. Let's run this. Okay, so yeah, we get seven for the first test. And then of course we still get a panic, but we get a hopefully helpful error message. Slightly better than unwrap, but probably still not what we want. Now let's assume we want our program to interpret any non-parsable elements as zero. That's actually fairly easy to implement using a function of result called unwrap or. So instead of expect, we're gonna call dot unwrap or and then we're gonna pass in zero. Unwrap or is very similar to unwrap in that if the result is of an okay variant, it's gonna return the value contained in that okay. But if the result is of an error variant, it's gonna return the value that we pass in to unwrap or instead of panicking, which is far better in most cases. So in this case, when we pass in ABC, it's gonna to fail to be parsed. Parse is gonna return an error variant. And then unwrap or is gonna return the value that we pass in to unwrap or, which is zero. Let's try to run this. Okay, that worked. So we get seven for the first one like always. And then the second one's three because we have three as the first element and then ABC is a second element, which is interpreted as zero. So the sum is three. Calling unwrap or and passing in zero works fine if we wanna assume that unparsable numbers are zeros. But what if we don't want two int to assume anything and we want the caller of two int to determine what behavior we want in the case where a number is not parsable. In that case, we'd probably want two int to return an option of an I32 instead of an I32. So if s.parse returns a result that's of the error variant, we want to return none. But if s.parse returns a result that's of the OK variant, we'd want to return a sum variant of an option that contains the value that the OK value contains. Hopefully that makes sense. That sounds a little complicated. We basically want to convert from a result to an option. There are actually functions of both result and option that make converting between the two very easy. In this case, we get a result and we want to convert it to an option. So we could actually just call the OK function. And then we change the return value of the function to option of i32. What OK does is exactly what I just described. If the result is of the OK variant, it returns sum of the value contained in OK. If it's of the error variant, it returns none. And so it discards the actual error value. This is pretty handy if we want our function to return an option, but it's making some calls to other functions that might return results. We can convert those results to options with this extremely simple code. We don't have to write any if let statements or match clauses. We can just do dot OK. Of course, now we do need to handle that option in sumster vec. So let's do that now. We're going to write a match clause here, and that's going to have two branches. And in the sum case, we're just going to return the value contained in sum. And in the none case, we're going to return zero. The result of the match statement is going to be added to the accumulator. If two int returns sum, we're going to extract the value within that sum and add it to the accumulator. If two int returns none, we're just going to add zero to the accumulator. So it's effectively a no op. Let's run this, make sure it works. Yep, we got seven and three. We got the same results as we did last time, but we got there a little differently. Instead of having two int assume that the caller wants unparsable numbers to be interpreted as zero, now we're having sumster vec determine the behavior when a number is not parsable. To do that, we have two int return an option of an i32. If the number was parsable, we return sum of the parsed number. If the number was not parsable, we return none. But because we only need to add to the accumulator if the value returned by 2 int is of the sum variant, there's actually a simpler way to write this. Instead of doing a match clause, we can use if let. And that looks like this. This if statement extracts the value within sum. The condition for this if statement says that if the value returned by two int is of the variant sum, extract the value from that sum. And then inside the if block, we add that value to the accumulator. If the value returned by two int is none, we don't do anything. So that's a little simpler than having that match clause with both branches for sum and none. Let's go ahead and run this, make sure it works. We should get the same result. Yep, and we do. But there's actually even a simpler way to write this. Earlier, we saw the unwrap or function of result. It turns out there's also an unwrap or function for option. So instead of if let sum val, we can just do accumulator plus equals two int unwrap 
four. This is the same thing we did in the two int function earlier, but that was a function of result, not option. The unwrap or function of option works very similar to how the unwrap or function works for result. If the option is of a sum variant, it returns the value stored in that sum. If the option is of a none variant, it returns the value that you pass into unwrap or. So in this case, that's zero. What if we no longer want to assume that unparsable numbers are zeros and we just want to fail outright if one or more of the numbers are not parsable? In that case, we might want to have sumster vec return an option as well. So let's change the return value of sumster vec to option of string. And then instead of directly returning the accumulator dot two string, we're going to return sum of accum dot two string. We actually don't need the return keyword if we forego the semicolon at the end of the line. Now that sumster vec returns an option as well, when two int returns none, we'd want sumster vec to return none as well because it found that one of the numbers was not parsable. We could write an if let clause or a match clause to do this, but there's a really nice shorthand to do this in Rust. We can use the question mark operator to propagate a none up the stack if a function call returns none. So in the case of two int, we have dot unwrap or here. We can just replace that with the question mark operator. That's all we need to do. Now if two int returns sum for all the elements in the vector, we're gonna exit the loop and return a sum value with the result string in it. If two int returns none for any one of the values, this question mark operator is gonna cause sumster vec to return a none value. Because the question mark operator is working on option here and option doesn't have a type for the none variant, these options actually don't even have to be of the same type. So even though this one's an option of an i32 and this one's an option of a string, we can still use the question mark operator in sumster vec because it's only going to be relevant when two int returns none, which doesn't actually have a type. There's also a question mark operator for result that we'll get to in a minute that doesn't have that luxury. Let's go ahead and run this, make sure it works. Now when we run it this time for the second test here, instead of getting a number value, we should expect none. And we do. For the first one, we get sum of the string seven. And then for the second, we get none, which is what we expect. The downside to sumster vec returning an option is that if something goes wrong, it's going to return none, which doesn't convey any information to the caller about what went wrong. The solution to that is to have sumster vec return a result instead of an option. And a result takes two types, the type for the successful case and the type for the error case. And for the error case, we're actually going to make our own error struct. We're going to call it summation error, which just is a generic way of saying something went wrong with summing up the numbers. For the second type of result, we're going to do summation error. On the last line of the function, instead of returning sum of string, we're just going to change that to OK of string because OK is a successful variant of result. Now, because 2int is returning an option, and in the case where the option is none, we want to return an error result. How do we do that? Well, now, obviously, the question mark operator doesn't work because the question mark operator returns a none if that option was none. So we need to somehow convert an option none variant to a result error variant. There's a really easy way to do that and it's with the OK or function. We saw OK or earlier. Again, that was a function of result converting to an option because s.parse returns a result. OK or is similar to the OK function up here in that it converts between option and result. In this case, we need to call OK or instead of just OK because if 2int returns a none, none doesn't have a type. In the case where 2int returns a sum variant with a value in it, OK or will convert that to an OK variant of result with that same value inside it. If 2int returns a none variant, OK or will return an error value of the type that we pass in. Because result also has a question mark operator similar to option, OK or returns a result. And then the question mark operator, if that result is an error variant, we're going to propagate that up the stack. So we're going to return that error variant immediately. Let's go ahead and run this. So now instead of having sum and none, we have OK of seven. That's the first test. And then error of type summation error for the second test. That's what we wanted. Now we have sumster vec returning a result. 2int was returning an option, but s.parse originally returned a result. So it seems like we're doing this in sort of a roundabout way. What if we want to propagate any result from s.parse all the way up the stack to the main function? For that, we can just change the return type of 2int to result i32, and s.parse returns a parse int error. So we'll make that the second type for the result. And we need to import this. And we can get rid of this OK function because we don't need to convert to an option anymore. We can just literally return the result that s.parse returns. Even though 2int and sumster vec now both return a result, the error type is different. So we can't just directly return the result from 2int all the way up the stack. So let's get rid of this OK or since we're not converting from an option anymore. 
We also can't do the question mark again because that error type is different. So let's change the error type of sumster vec to parse in error. See if that works. Okay, so now the question mark operator does work. Let's go ahead and run this and we get what we expect. The first one is okay of seven as always and we get all the details of the error for the second case. So it's wrapped in an error variant and it's of type parse int error and then we get a type of error, invalid digit. We've propagated the error all the way down in s.parse all the way up the stack to the main function and output it to the console. But what if we want sumster vec to hide the details of how to int works from the caller of sumster vec and we want to return a sumster vec specific error instead of exposing the caller to the details of two int. In that case we might want to go back to summation error as a return value for sumster vec but now we can't use the question mark operator anymore because the error types of the two results are different. Two int is returning a parse in error and sumster vec is returning a summation error. Now do we need to go and do a match clause or an if let clause again? The answer is no. There's actually another function called map error that handles this case easily. So all we need to do is dot map error and then summation error and map error takes a closure, not just the value. So it takes a function that takes the original error as a parameter and returns the value that you specify. So in our case, we're just returning a generic summation error that doesn't have any fields. So we can just ignore the value that gets passed in and voila. Now when two int returns an error variant, the map error function gets run and it calls the closure and returns the value that the closure returned. When two int returns okay, map error actually doesn't take any effect. It just returns the value that was contained in the OK variant. And again, we add that to the accumulator. Let's go ahead and run this and we should see a summation error again for the second test case. And yep, there it is. So that's a quick rundown of some of the common patterns you'll see when dealing with result and option. Each one has quite a few functions and the meaning of the functions might be a little confusing. In general, the unwrap family of functions extracts the value from the container if it's there. And if it's not there, it does something else that you specify. The OK family of functions converts between result and option. So if you have an option that you want to convert to a result, you do dot OK and then whatever flavor of that function you, you want. If you have a result and you want to convert it to an option, you do dot OK and it convert it to an option. And then finally, if you want to change one of the types of the container, that's where dot map comes in. So if you have a result with one error type and you want to convert to another result of a different error type, the map error function would be your go to. And then, of course, the question mark operator is used when you want to propagate one of the containers up the stack, either option or result. In the case of option, the types don't have to match. In the case of result, the error types do have to match if you want to propagate an error up the stack. I hope this video is helpful for you in understanding options and results and how to handle them. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.